doesn't do good work. And I just ask, want to ask your views on, uh, are you in favour of temporary rent supplement increases to actually assist people for becoming homeless uh, until supply is back in the market? Because whether we like it or not, we have to rely on the private sector currently to keep people off the streets because I know in my own constituency of Kildare North, I actually engage with tenants and landlords in trying to get them a property because they're not actually an attractive tenant for landlords because there's such a demand from other people that's not depending on social welfare payments to actually rent that property. So you have to engage to try and persuade the landlord to actually take them in as a tenant. And without that engagement, without that supply from the private sector, we'd have a lot more families homeless at the moment. So I think we have to, I'd like your view on the temporary increase until supply comes back in. And also, what's your view on the HAP scheme? The HAP scheme at currently at the moment is geared towards your accommodation need. So if you, for example, because again, shortage of supply, and if you're looking at getting a property which is one room more than you need, well then you actually have three choices. You stay homeless, you do have to make the top up, and anyone that believes the top ups aren't happening aren't genuinely on the ground. Or there has to be flexibility within the HAP scheme to allow uh, that uh, to be approved to avoid that family being homeless, because that is a reality. Because a number of families want some one-bedroom units. They're not available. If they get a two-bedroom unit to avoid them being homeless, they have to make up a massive differential in the rent because the HAP scheme is only geared at their need. So I'd like your, your view and your comment on that. Also, I'd just like to say is that, is the risk, in your view, of compulsory long-term lease, isn't that going to is there a risk in that, in eliminating those properties from being available for people that we need them, who's actually availing of social welfare payments like rent supplement, HAP, RAS, etc. So my concern is that while we want and we have to protect the tenant, some of the measures that we need to put in place as a matter of urgency, that the risk associated with them is equally as great because it might remove them from being considered by the landlord for going into that property which will then remain them being homeless. Also then, just uh, I would share uh, Deputy O'Sullivan's uh, comments in relation to the standard of accommodation and tenant protection in that regard, is that the problem is that there's, I have a number of constituents that I would know like others, and the standard, it's a minority, is appalling. But if they do complain, they're asked to move out while the work has been done and they're not being allowed to move back in. So that is, that is a problem. And What's the way around that? And again, I think there is no immediate answer until we get supply back into the system. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Deputy Quinlevin. Thanks, Chair, um, and thanks, Bob, for the presentation. Most of my questions were asked by Deputy O'Sullivan and have been answered, so I'm happy with that. But just, um, you know, just to say I've dealt with the threshold over a number of years, and your service is very good. It really does give solace to some people who are in very, very difficult um, situations. Your website is excellent, and I think the letters you can easily download from that, give it to the landlord and give it to the tenant or whatever, has prevented, I know in a number of cases we've dealt with, prevented people from actually becoming homeless. Um, do you have any idea of how many landlords have been um, brought to court or convicted or whatever for actually issuing illegal notices to quit. Is there any f stats on that? And second question is just a, a basic question about um, who actually monitors or does anybody actually monitor? Because we, we deal with a lot of people who, um, who say, for instance, the daughter's coming back from Australia, so you have to get out of the house, so, and the house is to be sold, or vice versa, and the house is never sold, you know, and it's rented out to somebody else. Is there anybody who monitors that? I don't believe there is, but is, is there anyone who, who, who would monitor that? And just what, the one last question there is, if you had a chance tomorrow, what two things would you do to stop people in private renting at the moment from becoming homeless, obviously due to increase of rent? What would you do, bring in tomorrow, two things that you could do to stop that? Thank you. Deputy Ryan. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Bob, for, for your presentation, but also for your more substantial document, which was very useful to us in our considerations. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, you, under the section forming the rent supplement scheme, you, uh, you've quite come up with a, quite a number of recommendations there in terms of administration, which seem to be kind of no-brainers in terms of uh, you know, implementing some change. They're obviously essential in the main, and clear in the main. With the exception of your final point there, and you might elaborate a bit on it, which is to introduce clear guidance 
for DSP representatives to deal with circumstances where receivers are appointed to properties with RS tenants. You might expand a bit on that for us. Uh, in terms of the tenancy protection service, which certainly in my experience is working well, uh, but even uh, the uh, flexibility that we're seeing, um, even directly from CWOs, outside of that tenancy protection scheme, I, I'm seeing CWOs uh, applying flexibility there. You, you're recommending that it, the, the protection uh, service be extended nationwide. So to what extent uh, across the country is there, is there a lack of consistency around uh, applying that uh, flexibility that the CWOs have? Uh, and in relation to uh, the, the point you make in terms of increasing rent supplement limits to reflect market rents, you indicate that they should be more targeted, related to local sub-markets, tailored to individual circumstances, and less vi visible to the market. In that, it would seem you're not necessarily arguing for a cross-the-board increase in rent supplement. Uh, and you may have touched on it somewhat, but I was about to ask in terms of the methodology for, for achieving the best outcomes and the best use of resources in that. Thank you. Deputy, Deputy Moran. Yeah, for the excellent report. I say since 2007, if we look at the crash and if you look at all the universities and the ITs right around the country, and you take, I take the Midlands area and I take Athlone, there's 5,500 students, up to 6,000 students have Athlone. If you just take the amount of accommodation that they're taking up, now we in the past tried to look to get uh, campuses built for them in terms of public private partnership, but it's the department won't allow it happen. They're completely against public-private partnership. I'd like to hear your views in relation to that. And also, all the talk is in relation to tenants and being pushed out of the houses. Where do we stand in relation to all the houses being taken up with tenants that won't move out, that have taken up uh, uh, quality accommodation, won't pay, no help to the person to take them out of there and free up that accommodation to allow people that deserve to be in them? We have an awful lot of that experience that right around the country now. It's been ignored. We're telling to go to this board and that board. It's not happening fast enough to help. To, and it, uh, trust me, I know from the area I represent, the for West Mead, that there is an awful lot of that going on. And if it could be some legislation around to, to help those uh, landlords to move out those troublesome tenants. But these troublesome tenants can move on, get accommodation elsewhere, in other towns, in other villages, right around the country. And it is an area that needs to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Moore. Mr Jordan, you're there to the final questions. OK, thank you. Um, just in relation to the, the last question there. Um, with tenants not paying, I suppose the first commandment in the private rented sector is thou shalt pay thy rent. That's the whole basis of the landlord-tenant relationship. There are plenty of rules there around that. I suppose it's a question of whether it's can't pay or won't pay. As I said, in the situation where it's can't pay and people, uh, then obviously we're trying to identify support for people to move on. The Residential Tenancies Board is the regulatory body for the private rented sector. A landlord can bring a dispute there. I mean, one of the issues certainly around the private, you know, the private rented sector is the fact that disputes continue to take quite a considerable period of time to be heard. And obviously the sooner they're heard from a landlord's perspective, the better. Um, in terms of like in terms of PPPs, I know that it's been talked about how well they've worked in school situation. I'm, you know, I'm not well versed enough to be able to, to comment on that, other than to say I think that we need purpose-built student accommodation. It probably could be modular, it probably could be dropped down on some of the campuses fairly quickly, and I would be in favour of that uh, because I think that will free up immediate supply in the in the rented sector. Um, in terms of the comments by Deputy Ryan, I mean. One of the things about the rent supplement scheme is that it isn't always about the limits, although the limits are extremely important, um, that the administration of the rent supplement scheme really uh, hinders tenants in quite a lot of ways. Um, for instance, a landlord, you know, if, you, uh, if a landlord has two tenants on their doorstep, one of them will have a deposit in their hand and the first month's rent in their hand. A, a rent supplement tenant will have a form. and that landlord may not see rent or any money for quite a number of weeks, six or nine weeks, or they may not see it at all if that tenant is not approved for rent supplement. Um, so the administration of rent supplement needs to be dealt with. We were saying the tenants need to be pre-approved for the scheme, uh, the administration needs to be speeded up and tenants need to be given deposits and all the support they need in order to compete in the market. In terms of rent supplement limits, clearly having very bra broad geographical regions with a single limit doesn't make sense either. And I suppose what we're saying is 
given all the data that's now available on the rented market that wasn't when the rent supplement scheme was introduced, that we need to have limits, more localised limits for wherever, Dublin 15, Dublin 24, the areas that are clearly under pressure, Dublin 1, Dublin 2. They should be clearly, um, community welfare service staff should be given a bandwidth in which to operate, but it should be less visible to the landlord. It shouldn't be put up on a notice board or on the Department of Social Protection website or the Citizens Information Board website exactly how much money you can aim for. That doesn't seem to make much sense to me. And, it, you know, and that's our experience of it. So I think what we're saying is uh, increase rent supplement, but in increase it for local sub-markets. In terms of the flexibility, if you'll remember from a number of years ago, uh, there was a, a directive introduced that said that people who were at risk of homelessness, rent supplement could be increased for them. In the same circular, it said in fairly bold writing, though, if you do this, if you make this decision, you have to report to the minister. Uh, so that had a total chill factor on discretion in the community welfare service. And to some extent, Threshold's tenancy protection service is kind of the outsourcing of discretion. Uh, I think increasingly um, the community welfare service is using more discretion, but it needs to be mainstreamed back into the, the mainstream rent supplement uh, scheme, clearly. In terms of receivers, I think what we were saying there is that very often um, the Department of Social Protection just ends payments for people when the tenancy uh, is when when the landlord changes, and I suppose some regulations need to be put in place to ensure that that payment continues even when a receiver is in place. Um, this has been a problem in the private rented sector for quite a long time. In fact, landlords very often one of their ways of getting tenants out was to ring the community welfare and say w one thing or another about the tenant and just stop their payment. Um, in terms of temporary when supplement increases, I mean, obviously that is something that we're working on, uh, delivering for people at the moment, and it works. I suppose what we're saying is that it should be available to everybody as far as possible across the board. In terms of HAP, um, I suppose the issue really with the HAP scheme is that their um, landlords are not familiar with the scheme, although there's a lot of benefits to it in some respects. I think that people who are at risk of homelessness um, shouldn't have to fall into homeless services in order to qualify for HAP. And we're hoping you know, to be able to deliver a service, at least with Dublin City Council, where we can move to people who are genuinely at risk of homelessness directly onto the HAP scheme without having to access homeless services. So there could be benefits to that. Um, um, in terms of um, standards in the private rented sector, I suppose I just wanted to say that um, I'm I know landlords are going to come in this afternoon and talk about bedsits. I just want to say that the, you know, a lot has been said in the public domain about uh, the new bedsit regulations, bringing properties out of the market, landlords forced to put tenants by the side of the road, and none of that is true. Actually, these bedsit regulations have been extremely successful. First, the first thing is that environmental health officers don't have the power to shut down any property even if it's substandard. The second thing is that, uh, and these are figures from Dublin City Council, that about 90 to 95 per cent of landlords have actually complied. In other words, they, have, they had a property, properties previously where they had shared toilets on the landing. Now each of those individual units have toilets. That's what the beds and regulations were all about, that 95 per cent of landlords have complied with that. Um, that means there's better accommodation out there. However, in the course of doing those inspections, Dublin City Council have discovered that about 50% of those properties did not comply with fire safety regulations. So that's actually been the big issue. So I would say that the, the bedsit measures have had a bootstrapping effect on the private rented sector. They've made bad accommodation into better accommodation. And actually, if you look, and I suppose the question is, where is all this bad accommodation gone? And actually, if you look at the registrations in the peer to be, you'll see there's over a thousand from last year uh, bedsits registered, which means the tenants are living in them. So. I don't know where properties have disappeared from the market. It would appear, actually, that the bedsit regulations have increased supply. And let me tell you how I think it's happened. Is that a lot of those older private rented properties were about 60% occupied because they were in such poor nick. Uh, because landlords uh, were, to some extent, compelled to bring them up to scratch, actually more properties, in some respects, have become available. So counterintuitively, the bed regulations may actually have added to supply and made better supply and we you know we cheered this on from day one and we believe it's been very successful and obviously these figures are available from Dublin City Council they're completely publicly available uh, so any rollback on those bedsit regulations would just be rewarding the very small number of landlords who have not complied with those regulations but who are still allowed to rent out their property
Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Jordan, uh, for, for your response to those questions. That concludes this stage of the presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you specifically for attending and your um, written submission. And I'd just say to colleagues, a number of the answers that Mr. Jordan gave, particularly the, the last few answers in relation to rent supplement and whatever, I think many of those will form questions for our next round of witnesses. There's a natural follow-on from a number of issues you've said there. So thank you. Thank you. A number of questions. None of them are answered. Uh, you asked just around in relation to yeah. sorry, the two yeah, measures sorry. that might be. Just remind me the question. There's two uh, measures to be inquired. If anyone was um, actually brought to court, the number of people you might have brought, yeah. landlords who brought to court, who give illegal, illegal eviction notices, and um, what two things you do tomorrow to stop people? Yeah, I think the, the two things is obviously to give people more money under the rent supplement scheme. Um, as I said, across the board, but in a different way, based on local submarkets, so that it's not obvious to landlords, and obviously giving people uh, security of tenure, uh, indefinite security of tenure, and the right to remain in their home beyond the sale of the property. In terms of landlords being brought to court, um, I'm not aware of the illegal eviction numbers. The last, it's, it's Residential Tenancies Board that deal with that issue, but I can just tell you from our own figures from last year. Um, I think we dealt with, I mean, over 20%, I suppose, of the clients that came to Threshold had a problem in relation to their security. Sorry, I'll just find the number here. Um, so in terms of tenancy terminations last year, um, there was over 1,500 people who came to Threshold in relation to that. And that could have included an invalid notice. That could have included illegal evictions as well. So it's a very substantial number. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. That concludes this session. We'll suspend briefly for a few moments while the next witnesses take their seats. Thank you very much. We'll go back now to public session. We're now in public session. Um, once again, to remind everyone with the mobile phones, uh, either flight mode or turn them off. Um, they interfere with the meeting, the recording, the broadcast. I also wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue sec of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting, and members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'd like to welcome the Department of Social Protection uh, to this afternoon, so it's still morning, this morning's meeting, represented by Helen Faulkner, Jackie Harrington, Carla O'Rourke and Rita Tai. The full submission uh, from the Department of Social uh, Protection has been made available to uh, members and, as I said, will be on the, the website afterwards. And I'd invite Ms Faulkner to summarise the submission and after that then colleagues will have a number of questions for you. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Chairperson, committee members, um, I'd like to thank the, the committee for the opportunity to um, appear before it on the matter of our Supplementary Welfare Land Scheme, or SWA, as it is most often referred to. Um, I'd just like to introduce my colleagues on my left is Jackie Harrington. Um, she's the principal with responsibility for SWA policy based in our um, headquarters office in Sligo. Um, on my right here is Carla Rourke, who is head of the department's Homeless Persons Unit and Asylum Seekers and New Communities Units in Dublin, based on North Cumberland Street and Gardner Street. And on my right again, um, Rita Tai, who is the area manager for Blanchettstown Intro Centre, um, which operate the full range of our department schemes, including supplementary welfare allowance. The SWA scheme acts as a safety net within the overall social welfare system and its objective is to provide assistance to people whose means are insufficient to meet their basic needs and those of their dependents. There are a range of payments and supplements administered under the SWA scheme ranging from the basic once-off weekly payments to once-off emergency payments and of course um, very importantly to this committee the, the rent supplement payment. The scheme is administered by the department's community welfare service and these 
staff have considerable experience in engaging with people facing challenging and financially difficult times resulting from, for example, unemployment, ill health, relationship breakdown, and who may end up in homeless services. These staff are generally based in our department's intro centres throughout the country, and they work very closely with local authorities, um, the homeless action teams throughout the country, and other local stakeholders, including non-government organisations, to provide the necessary financial supports to facilitate people to access accommodation. Overall, the response to the current extremely difficult housing situation has to be multifaceted, and this level of interagency participation ensures greater integration between the key agencies involved in the area of homelessness and related services. The Department is also represented on the Homelessness Policy Implementation Team um, in the, the newly formed Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government to oversee the implementation of that action plan. Fundamentally, the main cause of rising rents is a lack of supply, and the implementation of the range of actions under the Construction 2020 Strategy, the Social Housing Strategy 2020, and the most recent programme for government will support increased housing supply. But notwithstanding this, there is an inevitable time lag in the provision of new stock and the difficult and distressing challenges faced by people, including those in receipt of rent supplement, in maintaining suitable, affordable accommodation. And all of these issues are, are well documented. The state is a key player in providing support to these people, and it's providing almost 450 million euro um, this year in respect of a third of the private rented market under rent supplement, the housing assistance payment and the rental accommodation scheme. Almost 100,000 um, individuals and families are supported with their accommodation needs through these three schemes. Okay. I'm just going to provide some background information on the scheme, the rent supplement scheme and the steps being taken by the department to support um, customers to maintain their homes during these difficult times. The government has provided over 260 million euro for the scheme this year. There's approximately 56,800 people in receipt of rent supplement, of which almost 4,500 have been awarded in the first four months of this year. And the provision of this support <coughs> under the rent supplement scheme is a key priority for the department, and this issue is also currently under consideration by the newly formed Cabinet Committee on Housing in the context of the overall government commitments in the programme for partnership government to provide affordable, quality and accessible housing. And that programme for government includes the commitment to increase um, rent supplement limits. And the department is currently examining options for increasing the limits um, in line with this com commitment. The department has in place a number of targeted measures to ensure that people at risk of homelessness or loss of their tenancy continue to be supported under the rent supplement scheme at this time of further increased rents and reduced supply. We're operating an individual case management approach, which is kept under constant review in the light of vital feedback our staff receives from stakeholders, including customers, NGOs, and very importantly to um, Oroctus members. Under this approach, each tenant's circumstances are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And I can assure you that rents are being increased above the prescribed limits as necessary. Staff in the Community Welfare Service have a statutory discretionary power to award or increase a supplement for rental purposes. And this flexible approach has already assisted almost 8,200 households throughout the country to retain their rented accommodation. We estimate that for this year the average number of people receiving an uplift payment will rise to approximately 8,900 and that equates to about 16% of the average number of people receiving a rent supplement. These uplifts will cost approximately 23 million euro this year. In addition, the Department, in conjunction with Threshold, operates a special protocol um, as part of the Tenancy Protection Service in Dublin, Cork, um, and was recently extended to the commuter counties of Kildare, Meath and Wicklow. And in the next two weeks, it's going to go live in Galway City. All of those areas are areas where the level of housing supply is particularly acute. The primary objective of this Tenancy Protection Service is to provide advice and support to householders experiencing housing problems and who are at risk of homelessness. 
I suppose the, the, the key add-on um, for this service is um, that these people advocate on behalf of the clients and almost half of the calls um, about 4,000 to the threshold service were resolved with, without referral to our department for financial support. Um, and this protocol ensures a speedy intervention to ensure that our customers who are at immediate risk of losing their tenancy um, will get immediate financial assistance. The programme for a partnership government has identified expanding this protocol nationwide and the Department of Social Protection will work actively with the Threshold and the Department of um, Housing to ensure that that um, extension happens as, as speedily as required. The strategic policy direction of our department is to return rent supplement to its original purpose, which was a short-term income support scheme, mainly for people who are unemployed. And to achieve this, the government has two initiatives to deal with long-term alliance um, on rent supplement. The rental accommodation scheme, which has been in operation since 2004, and the more recent housing assistance payment, which started in 2014. And both of those are a key pillar of the social housing strategy and also our Pathways to Work programme. Under HAP, the responsibility for the provision of rental assistance to those with a long-term housing need is transferring to the local authorities. Um, the, the key benefit of HAP in terms of, say, the Pathways to Work is that this will ensure that households that find full-time employment, that they can retain their rented accommodation. HAP is currently operational in 19 of the 31 local authorities and there's a HAP homeless project operating in the four Dublin local authorities. To date, um, we've almost 9,580 people um, are in receipt of HAP and over one third of those have transferred from our rent supplement scheme. Just want to quickly mention um, two other supports as part of SWA, the exceptional needs payments. Um, under these, we can provide rent deposits or rent in advance um, to vulnerable people on low incomes who rely on the private rented market. And to the end of April this year, for example, 750 rent deposits, rent in advance have been paid at a cost of almost €465,000. In addition, just to mention, uh, the Humanitarian Assistance Scheme comes under SWA and um, 540 households who were badly affected by the flooding and bad weather conditions of the winter have been supported um, to restore their homes to a habitable condition at a cost of 1.1 million um, euro. So in conclusion, the Department recognises that homelessness is one of the most visible and distressing signs of the social impact of the crisis. There are specific actions that the Department are taking and will continue to take to address the problems. We are going to be examining the best options for increasing the rent supplement limits, which with the new rent certainty measures in place will give greater certainty to tenants. Our community welfare service will continue the targeted and flexible interventions in respect of increased rent payments. We will continue to support vulnerable prospective tenants with payment of rent deposits and rent in advance. We will continue to work with Threshold to support the Tenancy Protection Service and the proposed extension nationwide. We're continuing to examine ways of communication with people at risk to make them aware of the supports available. And I want to assure committee members that the Department continues to monitor monitor the supports in place to ensure that the appropriate response can continue to be provided. I would ask committee members that you too have a very vital role in this and I would urge you to advise people experiencing increased rents or people who that you become aware of who may be paying a top up to come and talk to us. Um, to contact either our own department's offices or threshold because we can support them. Um, but sometimes that key message is not getting out to the most vulnerable. So I trust this presentation is of assistance um, to the committee. I also just want um, to remind people that in terms of communication, we have key kind of posters that are on view in our social welfare offices, post offices, MABS offices. We circulated them to Oireachtas members. We're going to be reissuing them in light of the new, newly formed government, etc. And we would ask um, you to display them in constituency offices, etc. Um, and we will email copies of these to the committee members. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you very much, Ms. Faulkner, for your opening statement. A number of colleagues have indicated, so I'll take a few questions together, and you can decide who amongst you are probably most suited to any of the individual questions. Deputy Quinlevin, first, please. Thanks, <coughs> thanks for the presentation. Um, just query on the HAP, on the HAP scheme that you, um, most people who are on rent supplement are being put onto the HAP scheme, whether they want to go onto it or not. So they're getting letters from the, your department telling them they have to sign up for HAP or else their payment will be cancelled. You, you mentioned there briefly as well of if we we're aware of people who are getting the top, paying the top up on rent, on rent supplement. I think, let's be fair, like every single person who pays rent supplement, I think, is doing a top up. And that's something that probably doesn't be spoke about publicly, but I haven't come across a single person who's on rent supplement who isn't paying a top up. I top up every single person is it because the limits are far too low. You talk about extending the protocol there for additional payments to commuter counties outside of Dublin, which is welcome, and to, to Galway City as well. You don't mention Limerick City, and it's always perplexed me in the past why that was never mentioned because we do have a massive problem in Limerick, particularly around social housing and private rent in, in, in that sector. Can you, can you just, um, if you do have the numbers, if not, you could send them on to us later on, is the people who are on the HAP scheme per county who have got an additional top-up, because I've, some people, some councils tell you they can't give a top-up. I do know there's nine, 19 councils at the moment who are administering the HAP scheme for, for the department, and there's four Dublin councils do it through, through the homeless services, or, or in, and it's all operated out, out of Limerick. Out of Limerick Council, they operate all of it. But there, there is a perception there that the HAP limit is, is set, and they can't... It can't be increased, but I do understand it can be increased, and if we have numbers per county uh, of what's been done there. Thank you. Thank you Deputy O'Rourke. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, Helen, uh, for your presentation. I suppose at the outset, I want to I suppose, acknowledge the, your staff and compliment them on the great work they do in the RINS unit under extreme pressures and difficult times, and everyone, I suppose, shouting at them at different occasions to hurry up and all that. So, to do our engagement for me personally and for our office has been nothing but complimentary to your staff in the RINS unit. So, I want that put on the record. I suppose, in addition to that, Maybe that ties into the next point, is resources in the RINS units. Maybe you get your view on that, because uh, with no fault of the staff, and that's why I'm sure to put in that point, obviously approvals can take uh, some time, uh, and there is some delays which can result negatively in securing the property from landlords. So maybe get your view in the resources in this area, given the current issue around housing uh, and the crisis that's there. Also, maybe to ask your opinion or your view on the application process, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it has to be uh, a proper and transferable application process, as we spoke about earlier, it is actually extremely lengthy and there's a lot of documents to be prepared once somebody's approved on the housing list, but then once they go and find a property which the landlord is willing to go into and supplement, at that point they go off and have to get all the documentation to submit to the rinse unit. And by the time that's all gathered and put together, and then obviously there's an agreement coming back with the payment and an award the landlord sometimes kind of gotten numerous offers in the meantime and it can end up in people not actually securing the property. Uh, so is there anything that could be looked at as an interim in that uh, to, to try and prevent that situation occurring and maybe give them space to actually get the paperwork together and submit it and if it's not done so within a certain length of time maybe then the actual uh, agreement with the rinse unit and the actual tenant can be reviewed but just to try and speed up that process. The third thing is maybe I'd like you to clarify the role of the community welfare officer for doing emergency payments and deposits. Uh, if I understand you correctly you're saying that they have powers to actually assist in this regard and my personal experience in my constituency and from talking to colleagues is that that is certainly not the case. Uh, the community welfare officer is certainly refusing uh, to pay uh, deposits to help people in emergency situations. And only about a few months ago, I personally had a constituent uh, that I secured a property for them and it, they were waiting to get, uh, get into it and I rang and I looked for the CWO to make the emergency payment of the deposits and they told me that it wasn't within the remiss and it certainly wasn't within the jurisdiction and they wouldn't do it. We lost the property. And I have gone back on a number of occasions since and I'm getting the same answer. So I want you to clarify that and I certainly want that clarified for the record of this committee and then I want a clear and strong message to go back to the CWOs if 
there is a misunderstanding here. Okay, the fourth thing I'd like, I like the other speaker said, your view on HAP and RAS. I did raise this earlier in the earlier session, but I didn't get a uh, clear answer on it uh, because maybe it wasn't within that person's remit. Is that the HAP payment scheme, you know, for all reasons, it's a good scheme, but there is a discrepancy, and I raised it earlier, is that it, it's purely tailored at people's need. So if somebody needs a two bedroom unit and they only can get a three bedroom out there in the current scarcity of supply, they're only paid the rent through the HAP scheme, this is my understanding, for a two bedroom unit, which leaves them definitely paying a major top up. And as the other deputy said, everyone is paying top ups. That's the reality. It might not like to be acknowledged, but that's the reality. If they didn't, you'd have a greater crisis than you have today. So is there any flexibility or can we get flexibility in the HAP scheme that based on the current housing crisis that exists, that there would be flexibility in the payment? Uh, to the actual tenant that if all the seeking secure is a two bedroom when actually they need a one bedroom or you can make any combination you want that that will be looked at in the short to medium term and I'd ask you to your, for your comment the same in RAS I currently have a tenant at the moment in my constituency in a RAS unit she was homeless she's in a two bedroom unit and she's getting rent she's getting a HAP scheme and she falls into that very same situation. The landlord is willing to go into Roz to help her, but she's not accepted into Roz because she's over accommodated. She's a two bedroom and she needs one. We can't get a one bedroom for her. She's about to be put out on the street. This week she'll be made homeless if there isn't flexibility given by the department to the local authority to deal with that person. And also in relation to Roz, is it still compulsory or is there any flexibility around being, having to accept rent supplement for 18 months before you can go into a RAS scheme? Uh, because again, I have another case where we secured a property, landlord only wanted RAS, but she couldn't avail of it because she never had been in rent supplement. So I, I would like uh, some answers and your views on those issues. Thanks, Chair. This section, Deputy O'Dowd as well, please. Uh, yeah, I just uh, want to repeat what my colleague has said about the department. I've been around for a long time, but I've always found your department absolutely 100% committed to, to working for people, particularly the reps that we make uh, in relation to people who have difficulties assessing information. It's, it's actually top class, and when you ring them, uh, they're always focused on, uh, on on what the entitlements are, and they're, I have to say, I find them first class. Uh, to just two questions I have. Uh, one is it comes from uh, somebody who works in the county council, it deals a lot with people who are homeless, right? And the view he's put to me, and I've mentioned it here, but I'd like to get your opinion on it, is that at the moment, uh, you're not allowed to support a family in their family home. In other words, a, a son or a daughter who may wish to stay in the family home, notwithstanding the fact that they may have a child or, or a family there, uh, in other words, they have to leave the home to get support, financial support. And the point that he was making to me was that if there isn't accommodation for people and there isn't, if there was space in the family home that could the regulations be changed, uh, you know, for a limited defined period of time where, in other words, they could pay a rent at home. Uh, he, the point he makes to me is that they're paying a fortune in, in bed and breakfast accommodation. Uh, you know, they're paying a fortune hostels and so on that are not appropriate. And if it meant that it could be a payment in the family home, provided that the room was there as an exception measure, and that's the point he makes to me, could they be paid a, a rent allowance, or a, not obviously a commercial uh, rent, but that it would help ease the burden, it would, you know, that the, the family might be able to stay at home. Uh, and I know there's all sorts of social problems, and I won't go into them, we all know what they are, about why that shouldn't and couldn't happen, but there are places where it might and should happen. And that's really the case he made to me, uh, because there's a lot of space in homes uh, you know, that could be used, and it might make a difference. The other question I raised is the, it's the question of the room to rent scheme. I know it's not your responsibility as such, but where, where, where uh, people, people living in, in housing, that they have significant accommodation available in, that they, that they, that they give it to... Um, that they can give it to other people. It's the same principle, really. It's just that it would include direct family members. Now, you could rent to a nephew. In other words, I could, uh, un under the room to rent scheme, I could have my nephew living with me and I could take rent from him. You could pay him the rent. Uh, or my niece, or my granny, whatever it is. But I can't have my son or daughter. 
And in the exceptional case, and if people are on the streets of Dublin sleeping rough, and if people are in these inappropriately placed uh, hostels and children and their beds in, in, in staff rooms, it just doesn't make sense. Is, there, is, is it worth looking at? I suppose that's the point. And the last point I want to make is that you mentioned the tenancy protection service has been extended. Uh, and I just wonder what the situation regarding County Lloyd. You didn't mention County Lloyd, I think, in your day. So I put in a PQ while you were talking to see what the answer is. Uh, but uh, but the, the, the question, it, it comes around another problem. Uh, I'm, my office is inundated uh, with people who are homeless, who are trying to get accommodation. I know every deputy is, as well. So the problem is that local authorities haven't got the capacity to advise or to listen or to help these families in the way they used to traditionally. In other words, because there's thousands of people on the list rather than hundreds, they sort of say, well, go away, come back in five years' time. And there's huge problems building up. And I presume you know, this tenancy protection scheme is, as you said, which I like the word you use, an advocate for the applicant. What we really need is advocates with officialdom, advocates for the local authority, advocates for the person, and I say that because it, 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 people may not necessarily be able to articulate their best case because of the difficulties they may have, because of the medical problems, because of the social problems, because of the antisocial issues. And I think this is hugely significant and important, you know, if that is the case. And, and the question is, should, can you just describe it a little bit more, and should it not be, or what would you need to extend it to the whole country or to areas where there are other significant housing problems? Thank you, Deputy. Ms. Uh, um, I'll start with um, Deputy Quinlan and um, may I just say I just want to put on the record of the House that, sorry, the um, <laughs> The, the excellent work um, Limerick um, County Council has done in this whole area, particularly they were the, the initial start um, for the housing assistance payment, and now they are the hub for all the payments um, around the, the country, um, and they've done excellent work in there. Um, in terms of Limerick, and you're saying why the, the, the protocol has not been extended, um, in conjunction with our colleagues in the new Department of Housing, we will be looking and with threshold to see what areas of the country um, are most in need of the protocol to be put in place. But currently HAP is working extremely well in Limerick. There is over 1,200 people um, on HAP in Limerick. Um, so that the need for increased kind of rent supplement payments is very low. There's only currently about seven payments being being made there. there seven Pardon? There is seven payments being made. Seven yes, payments. yes. Um, but so, so what you say HAP works really well in Limerick, like it works well in the rural parts of Limerick and it okay. doesn't really work well in the city. And it's the same limit in both of them and that's where we have okay. a massive problem. Okay. And I assume that's the problem in other areas as well. Okay. Um, I'm on the, the HAP implementation board, so I can take that issue back as well in terms of, say, um, the, the, the top-up issues. You asked the question about the letters, yes. Um, rent supplement originally was designed, as I said, a short-term income support. So somebody is working in rented accommodation, they lose their job, they need um, support for a couple of weeks or a month or so until they get back into employment. But during the, the recession, that kind of went out the window. Um, but the big difficulty with rent supplement is that th there are barriers to employment in it, whereas under the HAP scheme, if you take up part-time or full-time work, your payments are adjusted, and the differential rent is on a, a need basis. Um, and under HAP, um, it has been proving successful to support people back into work. For example, 120 households moved from unemployed to part-time work, over 90 moved from unemployment to full-time work, and 10 from part-time to, to full-time employment. Um, without any kind of stopping or starting of their accommodation issues, it's, it's separate to that. So yes, um, we are focusing on people who are more than 18 months in receipt of rent supplement, and we are engaging with our customers. Um, now, we're not going to be forcing them out if their landlord doesn't want to go into the HAP process, etc. Um, but we want to engage and to try and support and encourage people because it is in their best interest, um, particularly to, to support them into um, employment. The whole area of top-ups, and part of the difficulty is that um, people won't come into us to declare their top-ups. 
key message I want to get out today is please reassure people not to be scared to come in and to talk to our staff because if somebody is struggling and trying to meet a top up payment we can increase their rent supplement payment to, um, to, to cover that aspect. Now not if it's a wildly exorbitant amount, but the majority of these people, that's not the case. Um, they're reasonable payments, etc. So they need to come in and talk to us. They will not be penalised in any way. Um, and the evidence is there of where people have come in. Um, they have been um, accommodated. Um, as I said, extending the protocol, we will be looking at the, the critical areas, particularly areas where we have a lot of increased payments um, by county or maybe where, where HAP is, is not in, in play. And we will work with the Department of Housing and Threshold um, to look at that. Um, Deputy um, O'Rourke, um, again, thank you, um, and Deputy Dowd for, for the compliments. Yes, the, the staff in the department ha have a challenging job um, in trying to meet the needs of customers, and often customers are distressed when they come in, and um, we do try our best um, to put people at ease and to try and meet their needs as speedily um, as possible. We continuously keep the resources in the department un under um, review um, to see um, where we need to act um, in the best interest of our customers. Um, we've put a lot of resources into our case officer work, engaging with unemployed people to try and support them um, as a first off into work, um, but otherwise then into education or training, to try and get people back into work and then hopefully be able to be self-sufficient in terms of meeting their accommodation costs. Um, we've cross-trained a lot of staff. Um, so. Um, we have kind of a new cadre of staff that are trained up to be um, community welfare officers so that if there is a particular need, um, for example during the, the flooding crisis um, in so many different counties over the Christmas and into January, we had staff available on the ground meeting people um, etc to, to meet their needs. Um, the application process, we've streamlined it to quite a degree. There used to be so many different elements to the application form. We've streamlined it as, as to, to a, a good degree. Um, and um, we try and engage with our clients to, to support them in, um, in processing the application. It is complicated insofar that it's kind of a two-stage process. It's not just the tenant. We do need the, the, the landlord's details um, in addition to that. But for example, in Dublin, um, Dublin's, the Dublin Regional Homeless Executive, um, with the NGOs, particularly with um, Focus um, Point and DePaul, etc., they have a frontline advocacy service. So they're engaging and putting in place um, rent deposits to, to secure accommodation where, where accommodation um, is tight. Um, just in terms of clarifying um, the, the issues around Selbridge and um, Kildare, um, um, quite a number of uplifts have been paid. Um, Currently, there's about 384 uplifts paid in Kildare um, for people in, on, in receipt of rent supplement. Um, I am a bit surprised that somebody would not be offering an exceptional needs payment to make a rent deposit, and maybe um, the deputy might just give me some instances afterwards, um, and I will follow them up. We have given clear instructions um, to our staff on actually two occasions last year, um, clear instructions to our staff to during this homelessness crisis to be as flexible as possible and generally the community welfare staff don't need our, our, our blessing in that respect they see it as a duty of care to their customers um, but with almost 7,000 staff in the department there, there can be instances where people may not feel or may not um, be reacting to that in the, the correct way so definitely if there are particular cases please bring them to our attention and we can address them but I will um, confirm that yes exceptional needs payments are being paid um, in relation to for example last year we made over two and a half thousand ENPs for rent deposits rent in advance at a cost of 1.48 million um, the average payment being around 590 um, euro and similarly the, the, the year before and uh, the figure I gave in the opening statement um, reinforces that so if there are particular areas of the country where you feel that's not happening particularly where there's acute supply, please um, let us know. Sorry,
that point, Kildare North would definitely be one of those areas where there's an issue with supply and homelessness. And that that directive that you're after reading me, that has been issued to all the CWOs, I take it, within the department? Yes, it has. Okay. Uh, well, it's, uh, well, we'll talk about it offside, but it's, sure. not, it's not happening. Sure. That's fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and there are particular issues around Kildare, Selbridge, etc., because, in effect, we're competing with... Um, um, some of the, the, the big um, businesses and companies that are located there, um, plus, say, the universities in, in Maynooth, and they're all causing kind of it, um, issues um, in terms of supply, and um, workers are competing for the, the same um, properties. Um, um, the issues around um, HAP, HAP and the, the rental accommodation scheme and um, the policy um, responsibility for them is with the, the Department of um, Environment. Um, there is flexibility um, under the, the HAP scheme. For example, um, Kildare, um, they're operating off um, the, um, the, the Dublin limits um, in Kildare, plus up to, to 20%. So that flexibility is there on the, the HAP limits, particularly of, of areas of acute um, supply. South Dublin County Council are operating with flexibility of up to 20%. The homeless HAP pilots that's operating in the four Dublin areas, they have flexibility to go um, up to 50% to try and secure um, accommodation. So the two departments and the local authorities are working very much hand in hand um, to try and ensure that that flexibility is there. But again, the big issue that we're coming up against is, is the, the supply issue. Sorry, I just thought mm. that I raised about the, the fact of somebody is over accommodated. Remember, I gave you the example of the two and the one bedroom. Is there any flexibility within the scheme to assist that family because they are left with a major top up to make or stay homeless? So, is, is that something you can address? I'll have to, I'll have to raise that issue with, with my colleagues just to um, confirm that. But generally, as I understand it, the local authorities are doing their best to operate the, the HAP scheme as best they can. Now, there's always the risk. Of, of say the over accommodation now whether it's a two or a three bedroom um, only one and two one and two um, as I say I'll take that issue back up with our colleagues in environment if it was a matter on, on rent supplement we would generally um, if there was no other accommodation available be pragmatic um, and try and meet the need though again when you're in a tight supply if you're putting a family into a three-bedroom accommodation and they only need a one or a two-bedroom, you're precluding a, a three-bed family from, from sourcing that accommodation. So it's trying to balance all the needs, which, which is not easy in, in that um, circumstances. Uh, and Deputy O'Dowd. Deputy O'Dowd. Um, and I suppose when, when we're looking at this and the whole issue of the family home and if there's accommodation in the family home, um, Ireland is facing a homelessness <coughs> crisis. So there has to be um, social responsibility of, of family members as well, that if they have accommodation available to them in, in a family home situation, um, my personal view is that um, they should be providing accommodation for their son or their daughter as, as necessary. Um, the room to rent... The, room to rent scheme um, and the tax benefits attached to that um, are a, a valuable um, incentive in this area for, for non kind of family members but um, ideally families should be trying to accommodate and generally we find that that is happening and oftentimes when somebody loses accommodation um, they are returning to family members but oftentimes accommodation can be very tight um, but um, at the minute, no, we would not be looking to pay a supplement. Um, that very point. Uh, I, I acknowledge what you're saying, yeah. uh, but w would it be a case that because mm. by staying in the family home, mm. there is an additional cost on the family or on the, the owner occupier, uh, or the ten or the in terms of you know heating and other issues sure. that wouldn't sure. otherwise be there? I'm just it's just a point sure. that was made to me well, by well, for example, by somebody homeless officer, yeah. Okay, somebody that. Well, I hear um, what you're saying, yeah. If you have a single person that's in receipt of rent supplement, they yeah. have to pay €30 Euro per week as their personal contribution towards their rent supplement. And presumably, if the person is on uh, in receipt of a social welfare payment, uh, that €30 Euro at least could go towards offsetting the costs 
um, of, of staying in the house, plus some contribution from their, their social welfare payment, because uh, they would be expected in their private rented accommodation to meet their heating um, and lighting and cooking facilities, etc. So there would be scope within their social welfare payment, plus the €30, Euro, or if there were a couple, a €40 Euro payment per week that they would have to pay towards their rent. And we would expect them to be contributing to the, the family home. Homeless officer, that issue, then I'll take care of okay. Okay. Um, oh, I think you. that was the. Sorry, just in terms of the um, loud. Um, um, HAP is working extremely well in, in Loud. We've over 800 tenancies in Loud, and it's supplemented as well. We've 130 rent supplement uplifts um, being payable in in the Loud area. So it's 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 kind of working well at the, at the minute. Um, and I suppose just you, you mentioned the the advocacy piece. Um, yes, the tenancy and the work with Threshold is doing excellent work, um, and there's up, you know there's about 8,000 calls into Threshold. But when we look at the overall, there's at least 6,000 um, households throughout the country who have been supported by the Community Welfare Service. And our staff, they feel that they have an advocacy role. Um, for example, I was talking to, to Rita, who is the, as I said, the manager in Blanchardstown before coming into the meeting. They've engaged with the local communities, with um, some of the teachers in the local schools, where parents, where they're aware that parents are in difficulty. Um, and at times they've negotiated directly or got in touch directly um, with the landlords um, in these instances. So uh, the department would definitely feel we have an advocacy role in this space, but also our community information, our citizens' information centres throughout the country and our um, MABS offices have a, a, a supportive role in this area and they, they shouldn't be forgotten. Thank you very much. Um, just to follow up on the point that Deputy O'Rourke, you might send that response in relation to the over accommodation on is somebody being classed as technically over accommodated, particularly on, in a two bed for a, a single person where one bed isn't available in the RAS and the HAP schemes. You might send that to the committee as a re reply. Appreciate that. Deputy Function. Um, Chair. Um, I suppose I have a, a bit of a difficulty because I don't see any uniform approach, and I mean that even in, in terms of, um, let's say, Kilkenny, for example, one community welfare officer versus another. It seems to be completely it depends on who you meet and depends on the day, because I have never experienced anyone getting rent in advance. Deposits are a major issue. People uh, coming from either overcrowded situations, coming from emergency accommodation, not being able to get deposits. I've, the offer of rent in advance, I've never even heard of that until today. Um, th there's also an issue with people coming from going into RAS 